So we're delighted to welcome you this morning to a landmark historic event that's happening here. Um, we have three chief executives from Montgomery, Prince George's and the District of Columbia who are here with us to speak about an incredibly important issue for our communities, that of homelessness. Um, to kick off the events, I'm going to ask uh, our council president, Mr. Leventhal, to come up and say a few words. But I do want to acknowledge um, there are many, many folks who are very important to the issue of homelessness around here. Um, but I also wanted to call out um, Mr. Van Hollen's um, aide, who's here, um, right in the back, Susan Lofthelm. Um, just welcome, Susan, and thank you for being here. And I will turn the podium over to Mr. Leventhal. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is my neighborhood. I live just a few blocks away. and. Um, I interact with some frequency with the clients here at this facility as well as those in the area and in the neighborhood. And I can um, tell you anecdotally that the homeless population here is very much um, on the border and does not uh, you know, firmly distinguish where the clients are going to hang out, whether it's on the north side of the Maryland DC line or on the DC side. And I've been speaking with um, Uma Alawalia and uh, with uh, the District of Columbia staff and certainly we'd like to work with Prince George's County as well to better integrate our client service operations uh, where you um, have a policy as we have in Montgomery County where individuals can get a meal here at this facility regardless of you know their background or their circumstances but when it comes to providing housing uh, Montgomery County taxpayers are working uh, very hard to support people who became homeless in Montgomery County, but our policy is that we will not provide permanent long-term housing for those who became homeless elsewhere. And so um, keeping track of clients, particularly those who may be ill, vulnerable, uh, exposed to hazards, um, I think we can do a lot better communicating among the jurisdictions and keep track of cases and having a place to refer clients. I don't think we're always um, apprised here in Montgomery County, our caseworkers and those who are interacting with homeless clients about where in DC and where in Prince George's County we can refer clients. So there's a lot to be gained from this conversation that is beginning this morning and I think I'm correct. I think this uh, conversation was the idea of our distinguished guest, Mayor Muriel Bowser, uh, who's been very much involved and in uh, today's paper has um, uh, several new approaches that she's proposing in the District of Columbia. And then Prince George's County Executive Rashern Baker is here and our own County Executive Ike Leggett. So it's a pleasure to introduce all of them and I'm really looking forward very, very much to today's conversation. Thank you. Good morning. Let me acknowledge uh, George Leventhal again. Uh, you could not find a more passionate champion for the plight of people generally, especially poor people and those who are homeless. So let's give him a round of applause for all the work that he's done over the years. Um, I'm delighted to welcome back to Silver Spring Mayor Bowser and County Executive Baker. Uh, you note that uh, County Executive Baker was a little bit late. Uh, he was generally late at law school and classes as well as I remember. <laughs> so he's, he's certainly impressed and we're very proud of him. He received the, an outstanding award for as one of the outstanding alumni from Howard University Law School a couple of weeks ago. But some things still have not changed. <laughs> All three of us share a deep commitment to end homelessness. Our jurisdictions are strong. Our staffs and nonprofits and faith-based partners are competent, and our personal relationships go back a very long ways. There's never been a better opportunity for the District of Columbia, Prince George's County, and Montgomery County to collaborate on this important issue than today. We are here this morning to discuss a unique issue that creates a difficult challenge, and at the same time, an opportunity for us to resolve much of that challenge, if not all of it. There are those who might think of homelessness as something that happened to someone else, and there are those who think that it is not a problem in our community. It is. And yet, for many, becoming homeless is much closer than you think. There is no community in this region that is without homeless people. 
Families might be only a lost job or a serious injury or illness or a divorce, a death in the family, away from losing their home. These events happen in the best of times, and certainly they will happen more often in some of the difficult times as we are having today. Things have been tough here in the Washington region, not only through the Great Recession, but continuing through government shutdowns, sequestrations, and the consequences of those very difficult impacts on our economy. Our homeless people are old, they are young, they are single, and unfortunately, they are families as well. They are veterans. Some are well, others are ill, but all deserve a home. Although the overall economy is improving somewhat, times are still tough, and they are likely to stay tough for some period of time. Here in Montgomery County, we take an annual one-day survey to use as a measuring tool for our progress in combating homelessness. And last year, and many years in the past, George Leventhal has gone out and actually helped make that count. The Point in Time survey is coordinated by the Council of Governments, so I am sure that other areas are doing so as well. Some years, the numbers have gone down, others have gone up. In 2014, we saw a decrease in homelessness from 2013. But based on all indications, it is anticipated that that number will go back up again. In Montgomery County, as in other jurisdictions, we have a number of ways to help alleviate homelessness and to help those who are homeless by providing shelter, food, health care, and other kinds of support. We do this with our own government programs and by working together with a variety and a comprehensive network of dedicated workers, nonprofits, and faith-based organizations. We have devoted considerable resources to build an affordable housing and to provide an emergency shelter. Montgomery County was one of the first localities nationally to provide a 10-year plan, adopting a strategy developed by the National Alliance to End Homelessness. Our plan proposed strategies to end homelessness on three fronts. One, closing the front door through efforts to prevent people from entering homeless in the first place. Second, open the back door by rapidly moving people out of homelessness into permanent housing. And three, building a foundation to assure that people have access to employment and the variety of things that they need in order to be successful in our community. Over the past decade, guided by this plan, we have transformed our system to a housing first model that emphasizes rapidly moving people to permanent housing and addressing the needs that they may have. Montgomery County Continuum of Care has recently approved an updated plan to this 10-year plan. The plan includes the following. Setting a path to ending homeless over the next two years by ending veterans homeless by 2015. And we're actually in 2015, and we intend to accomplish that. Ending chronic homeless by 2016, and ending family homeless within five years. Yes, we can do these things, but believe it or not, we still have a long ways to go and need to do much more. I believe that now is the time for a new approach. <coughs> this is why we are here today. Montgomery County, the district, and Prince George's County already work together on a variety of issues, from water treatment systems, mass transit, criminal issues, and many others. This gathering this morning provides us with an opportunity to work more closely together on an issue that affects all of us. This is a unique challenge because within our three jurisdictions, there are no boundaries to homelessness. People can easily move across Montgomery County into the district into Prince George's County and back and forth. They will not only be here today in this very room, people from throughout this region, right in this room, having a meal today. We welcome them here in Montgomery County as our friends from the district and Prince George's County and we'd like to ensure that they have the services that they need. This is why it is critical that our three jurisdictions continue to work together toward ending, ending this particular problem. That accident of geographical inconvenience or convenience, however you look at it, gives us the opportunity to closely tie our jurisdictions more closely as we jointly decide to work together more effectively on this very difficult problem. Again, welcome back Mayor Bowser and County Executive Baker. Thank you.
I know that um, those in Montgomery County affectionately call him <laughs> County Executive Leggett, uh, but he's always Professor Leggett to me. <laughs> I'm always learning. Um, you know, I normally start off saying it's a great day in Prince George's County, um, but it's a great day in Montgomery County. <laughs> And it's a great day in the District of Columbia. <laughs> Madam Mayor, it's always uh, good to see you. And um, let me commend you on calling us together on this very important task um, as you embarked on your first uh, few months as mayor. Uh, you're doing a great job. Um, you know, like me, you are very fortunate to have County Executive Leggett as someone you can call upon. I know he's been a great help to me, and I know he has been to you. So I want to thank you for your work. Um, I also want to uh, thank uh, George uh, for being here and his leadership in Montgomery County. Um, this is a very important issue to all of us. Um, over the last four years in Prince George's County, uh, we have been using our 10-year plan to end homelessness as our roadmap. Like my colleagues throughout the region, we know it is an important issue to minimize the situation that caused homelessness. And if it is not un unavoidable, we must stabilize the living condition for families and individuals. Permanent housing with appropriate supportive services is always the best practice that lessens the impact on the whole family and moves people into self-sufficiency. We know that our families and our unaccompanied youth do not recognize, as County Executive Leggett said, borders. They go between the District of Columbia Montgomery County and Prince George's County. We know that they, they will go wherever the services are that they need. That is why we took action in Prince George's County in 2012 to create a safe space for homeless, homeless and runaway youth, regardless of what caused them to run away and regardless of their sexual orientation. Promise Place in Prince George's County is a public-private partnership between the Prince George's County government, Sasha Bruce, and the Weinberg Foundation. In addition to that facility, we have partnered with the Maryland Multicultural Youth Center, St. Anne's, to increase our capacity to assist our youth and expand our options available to stabilize them, do course correction, and change the trajectory of their lives. I'm encouraged to know that we, I'm encouraged to know that we have done more in the last four years than ever before to help our marginalized youth. Here in this region, I know a couple of things. I know that currently we, our systems do not talk to each other. We know that we do not intentionally share data. We do not intentionally pursue regional opportunities to develop programs that will address the needs of our citizens. And we do not intentionally pool financial resources to address the gaps between the gaps or support for marginalized or subpopulations. Uh, All of that is about to change. That is why we're here today. All three jurisdictions are here, and we are committed to improving both individually and jointly our systems of care and our support of resolving this issue to contribute that contributes to homelessness. It is a proud day for me to be County Executive of Prince George's County and to be part of this effort. It is truly a great day. And on a personal note, Mayor Bowser, as I say often to my staff, I started my actual real job as an adult out of law school after working at the District of Columbia for a year with a nonprofit in the District of Columbia. And part of our charge was, it was the first time my boss and my very first week, um, sent me down to one of our um, community centers where we actually addressed the needs of homeless population and a food shelter. And as she sent me down there, and I've said the story before, I told her I know nothing about, you know, homeless population or food shelter. I actually went to law school. <laughs> and she said, you're just the perfect person to go down there then. <laughs> you can learn a lot from these folks. It was the most educational experience I ever had, and it was the best preparation to be county executive. Because you understand the needs of not just those who can advocate for themselves. You begin to understand the needs for those who can't. 
but you also understand what County Executive Leggett said, and that is people end up in situations for reasons you never understand and people you never thought would be there. People you never thought would be there. Our job is to provide a service throughout this region. That is why it's critical for all three jurisdictions to come together. And that is why I'm so proud that Mayor Bowser called us together. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. And Mr. County Executive, it is indeed a pleasure for me to be back in Silver Spring. Uh, Mr. Uh, County Executive, it's always good uh, to, to be in your presence. And for those who don't recognize our reference to Silver Spring, I spent a good part of my early career uh, working in Silver Spring on its development and transformation. Um, and I'm always very happy to be in Silver Spring because I am the proud mayor of the District of Columbia, but I only live about four miles from here, so I can keep an eye on you and make sure everything um, is going exactly right. Um, and while all great ideas, they say, have a thousand fathers, uh, or mothers, as it were, uh, I, I want to acknowledge County Executive Leggett for his leadership in pulling us all together today. Uh, I have been able to, to count on, on these gentlemen in our transition County Executive Baker had me out uh, to, to the, the county office building to talk to me about what was coming. And shortly after I was sworn in, uh, county executive and I had breakfast at our favorite place, Parkway Deli, also very close to the border. Uh, and top on the agenda was how we would work on a number of regional challenges. We're talking about homelessness. We could be talking about traffic. We will be talking about safety. Um, and so many of the issues um, that affect our, our residents, we can work together on. Uh, what everybody should be pleased to know is that you're looking at uh, three executives who support uh, and who have demonstrated through their records um, regionalism and how we can, and I saw your head pop up, Chuck Bean, his head <laughs> popped up when I said that, uh, but we support, and he should, uh, the ex executive director of our, uh, our council of governments, uh, on the tough issues that don't know boundaries, we have to work together. Um, so we know that it is vitally important that we have a regional approach um, to solving the problem of homelessness in our region. Um, our challenges are great, and I think that you've heard from all of us up here that this is not a problem um, that where there is a silver bullet uh, solution. It's going to require fresh ideas, highly energetic people, um, but more than that, it's going to require the political will to solve the problem. Um, and what I have challenged my team to do is to look at the problem, make sure that we're quantifying what it's going to take, and let everybody know, you're shaking your head, that's good, right? <laughs> what it's going to take. <laughs> and I know our partners in the legislature, Mr. County chair, Chairman, uh, and our, our, our own chairman in the DC Council, who I'm sure would have been here, but he's in session today, um, are at the table with us, making sure that we're coming up with solutions that work. I also challenge my team um, not to bring back solutions that have been tried and failed, and we know don't work. And we in the district, as you have stated, uh, Mr. County Executive, uh, we're returning to policies that have worked for us in the past, making sure that we're putting housing first. And when we put housing first, we know that our residents can deal with the other issues that have led um, to their homelessness. We know that on any given night in the, in the district, 8,000 residents experience homelessness, nearly 4,000 single adults, and almost 3,800 presenting as part of a family or household. Um, and that's only part of the story. In the district, uh, we know what our significant issue is, is that one in five households are spending more than half of their income on housing. And we count those people as housing insecure. 
That leaves little room um, for necessities like food and health care and transportation or even the cost of education, getting their children back and forth to school or making sure that they have um, needed necessities for school. Uh, too many are one job loss, one gap in employment, uh, one injury away from experiencing homelessness. So that's why we're here to talk about a comprehensive approach um, that will allow us to achieve, achieve our goal in the district of having homelessness, whether you're a veteran, a single adult, or a family, be rare, brief, and non-recurring. The District of Columbia spends tens of millions of dollars every year to help our homeless residents but we lack the commitment or the comprehensive approach to end homelessness. Right now, we have a system that's constantly in an emergency mode. In the winter, we spend millions of dollars sheltering people in aging facilities and motels across the city, and we know we need to do better than that. We need to shift our emphasis and our investments to real solutions for DC residents. My team, uh, through the Interagency Council on Homelessness right now, and it was referred to by Mr. Leventhal, is working on a plan to achieve these goals of making homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring. The first draft uh, is under review now by stakeholders in the homelessness community, um, and we hope that the council will vote on it, the interagency uh, council will vote on it by the end of the month. Um, and also, uh, we hope that we will have a commitment from all partners in the District of Columbia to put the resources necessary behind the plan to make sure that we can achieve the plan's ambitious goals. Um, some people have written already that our plan is ambitious. <laughs> but you have to be bold if you are going to achieve these goals. And that's what the people want. I haven't gone to a community meeting yet where people said, you know, all those homeless, forget about them. I haven't gone to one neighborhood where people think it's okay for families to live in dilapidated facilities. What people want to know, however, is that their government is not wasting their money and that they have a plan to get people to self-sufficiency. And you have to be bold, you have to be com committed, and you have to have the political will to get it done. We know that there are a lot of things that we have to focus on to keep people from becoming homeless, and we're also committed to that. Uh, we in this region, and I know that the county executives will share this view, wherever we go in the country, people are actually with straight places with the Washington region in a heartbeat. Uh, we're growing, we're attracting people, we have good paying jobs here, but that progress and that success has also put a lot of pressure on housing prices. So our joint commitment to affordable housing investments will help us with our homelessness crisis. The District of Columbia this year, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to present a budget to the council that will include a $100 million commitment to affordable housing. And that's a good thing. We also know that uh, if, no matter how much money we put in affordable housing, if people don't have good paying jobs, um, then they won't be able to afford housing. Um, and I've challenged my team to make sure that the money that we're putting in, $45 million alone in job training at um, our Department of Human Services, is going to make sure that people are getting into good paying career path jobs to prevent um, homelessness in the first place. We know that our commitment to schools um, is a long term commitment that is going to help us in the affordable uh, housing housing area um, and in preventing families from getting into uh, a situation where they're homeless. The bottom line for me is that the residents of the District of Columbia have said, uh, we are a city that's moving in the right direction. We're prosperous and growing, but none of us can be satisfied uh, with the level of homelessness for families, for singles, 
um, in our city, and we're willing to step up to the plate um, to deal with it. I'm so grateful that I have partners in Prince George's County and Montgomery County who share a vision for this region uh, where we grow, but where more people participate in that progress. And I'm looking forward to the solutions we find today. Thank you. I need to say, as a citizen of the region, 50 years, high school at Walter Johnson, I wanna thank you all. I have deep respect and appreciation. This is a long time coming, so I bow to each of you. Oh my word, there are so many friends in the room. That too comes from 30 years um, working uh, both in the district of Montgomery County and in Prince George's County. So I appreciate the opportunity to moderate this important piece of the summit where we will hear both national and local perspectives on ending homelessness with a clear focus on the four cornerstones, the root causes, housing, workforce development, economic development, and supportive services. We're gonna start with um, the, the national perspective and then move into a conversation with the leaders um, who are actually running the programs and running the departments um, to, sort of, to respond and, ask, and answer some questions both locally and regionally. So I wanna introduce Leah Hendy from Urban, the Urban Institute. Her presentation, again, will offer a national perspective. Um, and I wanna say a little bit about Leah. Uh, I've worked with her um, and Metro, which is the name of their division at Urban, for a number of years and have great respect. She's a senior research associate at Urban, has focused her research on housing policy, including the foreclosure crisis, and on policy to improve neighborhoods. She's experienced with working with local administrative and national data sets, and I know one of you um, talked about sharing data, and that's so, so important, um, to create neighborhood indicators and study neighborhood conditions. Since 07, she has been involved in Urban's work with the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership, which is on their website and is a phenomenal resource and I, I'm doing a little bit of a plug. She's leading the pro uh, project with six NNIP partners focusing on data system to address neighborhood problems. She actually serves as a deputy director of that program and of Urban's evaluation of the choice neighborhoods. She holds a master's of public policy from the McCourt School, where I am right now, so we have a <laughs> at Georgetown, and. Um, She's going to offer the national perspective and then we'll have that conversation. Leah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm honored to follow such an esteemed set of executives um, and share some thoughts with you on the national perspective on reducing homelessness and housing instability and what some of the local challenges and opportunities are and I don't know if you saw up front, but there was a ha handout with the slides to my presentation. Um, but if you don't have them, you should be able to follow along as well. So first I wanted to review some of the national trends on homelessness. Overall, homelessness decreased about 3.7% between 2012 and 2013. And there were more than 7% declines in veterans homelessness and chron chronic homelessness for individuals. The number of homeless families decreased 24% between 2007 and 2013, but only in areas where there was no right to shelter. However, it increased by more than a third in areas where there is a right to shelter, which includes the district in Montgomery counties, as well as New York City, Columbus, Ohio, Hennepin County in Minnesota, and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In this region, between 2013 and 2014, the Council of Governments reported an increase of 3.5% in overall homelessness, in part due to the increase in the District of the Columbia. 
But the report also noted continued progress in moving the chronically homeless population to permanent supportive housing. As many of you are aware, the count of homeless people often reflects the supply of beds in emergency shelter and transitional housing in a jurisdiction, um, particularly if there is not a right to shelter in that area. 72% of people entering shelters are coming from living with family or friends, typically not long-term stable situations and not from off the street. Housing instability is a problem that affects more people than the currently homeless population alone. Nationally, between 2011 and 2012, the number of people in poor households who were doubled up remained about even at 7.4 million, but it had increased 7.7% in the district and less than 1% in Maryland. A study by one of my colleagues found that 40% of surveyed very low income households who were on waiting lists for housing assistance were living doubled up with family or friends. More than one half of those households were living, who were living with friends had reported that they had gone without their own place to stay at least one point during a, the previous 12 month period. Other researchers found that connections to an extended family member are frequently the only thing that distinguishes homeless people from housed people in similar circumstances. Researchers in Minneapolis studied 47 people who were either already receiving housing assistance or on the wait list for housing assistance. They interviewed each person and created detailed histories of where and with whom those people had lived and how often they had moved. On average, they accumulated more than 20 years of information for each person. These 47 people lived in nearly 682 accommodations with an average accommodation spell lasting less than two years. 30% of the accommodations were doubled up, and 89% of respondents reported doubling up at least once. There is a growing acknowledgement, though, that housing has benefits beyond just representing a place to sleep at night. The homeless field has increasingly moved towards the idea it is necessary to get people into permanent housing as quickly as possible, and once they are st housed stably, work to connect them to jobs and other services. This housing first approach has been adopted by all the jurisdictions in the Washington region, though there is a continuum with how they're implementing it. Families struggling to pay their rent may be skipping out on other essentials, which can be particularly damaging for the vulnerable, for children, elderly, and the disabled. Research has found that low-income families with children living in affordable housing, whether it's subsidized or not, spend $151 more per month on food than families with severe housing cost burden. Cutting back on food has the potential to hinder children's physical and cognitive development. In order to pay rent, families might be cu cutting back on after-school activities or needed prescriptions to maintain physical and mental health. The MacArthur Foundation has funded a whole series of projects that have demonstrated how housing matters and the concept of housing as a platform. Research has shown that children living in overcrowded or unstable situations complete less school and have lower test scores. Housing could also create a platform for returning citizens who often struggle with both immediate and long-term housing instability and give them an opportunity to seek gainful employment. As many of you are probably aware, supportive ha housing with services has allowed many people to stabilize their physical and mental health conditions and save money in our housing and health systems. Nationally, thinking about how to address homelessness is moving towards a more comprehensive vision that takes into account not only housing assistance, but thinking longer term about housing affordability, raising incomes, connecting to jobs. During the rest of my presentation, I'll focus on these challenges and opportunities that exist here. The first challenge is to address rental affordability. According to George Mason Center for Regional Analysis, rental costs in the Washington metro area were the second highest among the top 15 metros and almost 70% above the national average. They increased more than 21 percentage points since 2008, the largest increase of those top 15 areas and about half of renters in the nation and half regionally are cost burden, where they are paying more than 30% of their income in rent. The housing crisis and changes in demographic patterns are also contributing to increased rental demand. 
The crisis led to declines in the homeownership rate and delays in household formation. Over the next decade, the Joint Center for Housing Study estimates the number of renter households will increase between 4 and 4.7 million. Some of this increase will be due to the aging of the baby boomer population. They are likely to account for over half of renter growth. In both 2000s and the 2010, or in 2020s, based on projections from my colleagues at Urban, the net increase in renter households will exceed the increase in owner occupiers. This reverses the situation from the 1990s and 2000s when baby boomers and Gen Xers were still moving into home ownership and out of rentals. Rental demand and the high cost of housing is, are contributing to the challenges poor families face. For the homeless population in our region, it is largely this challenge that is a barrier to finding permanent housing. In a study funded by the Na Community Foundation for the National Capital Region and the Morris and Gwendolyn Kayfritz Foundation, we found that most, most of the homeless population, particularly persons and families, did not need permanent supportive housing. Their permanent housing solution is to move to affordable rental housing. However, in both the US and regionally, there are large gaps in the availability of affordable housing. The amount of affordable housing that it serves the extremely low income in the US is limited and has been decreasing over the last decade. In 2000, there were 37 affordable and available units for every 100 extremely low income households. This decreased to 29 units by 2012. In our region, extremely low income households make about $32,000 or less for a family of four. The district has more of these units, um, but still has seen significant decreases between 2000 and 2012. While Montgomery and Prince George's are at lower levels, they have seen less change over time. In addition, we have far fewer of these units without federal subsidies through public housing and housing choice vouchers. Unfortunately, even factoring in these subsidies, there are not enough units to meet the need. In the region, there were only 32 vouchers or public housing units for every 100 extremely low income households. Federal spending for vouchers and public housing is unlikely to increase. More locally funded vouchers and subsidized units may be needed to fill the gap. However, the region and these jurisdictions do have many opportunities and are, are dedicating a substantial number of resources towards this issue. Combined in FY 2013, these three jurisdictions totaled 989 million in housing related expenditures, the bulk of which goes towards renter assistance. But more than 60% of those funds came from the federal government and jurisdictions may increasingly need to find ways to use local revenue to support housing and homelessness programs, such as the district's housing production trust fund. These jurisdictions also have a range of tools available to them to address affordable housing, from inclusionary zoning, where Montgomery has one of the oldest programs in the country, policies to preserve the existing affordable housing stock, allow accessory dwelling units, or give local government the right of first refusal on the sale of multifamily rental buildings. But the high cost of rental housing is only one side of the housing instability challenge. The other part of the problem is low incomes. A single mother with two children who needs a two-bedroom apartment and is a nursing aide would struggle to with housing instability in this region. She'd have to work two full-time jobs to afford the median rent in Montgomery County and more than one and a half in the district and Prince George's. It's not until you get into occupations that require more extensive training or education like an EMT or a teacher that this single mom would have a better chance of finding an affordable apartment although it still might be a challenge. And we know that incomes haven't been keeping up with rents. George Mason calculated the real per capita income in the metro area declined 4% between 2008 and 2012, the third largest decline among the top 15 metros after LA and Miami. To increase incomes, the region needs to better connect workers to growing job sectors. Uh, in a paper for the World Bank, researchers classified U.S. workers into five job skill categories by college attainment. Very low, where fewer than 20% of those in the occupation had at least some college jobs like machine operators and maids, to medium skilled jobs where 46, 40 to 60% of workers have at least some college um, jobs like postal service clerks and retail salespersons, and so on. Between 2000 and 2011, the very low skill category lost nearly 16 million jobs, 
nationwide, and the low skill category gained only 2 million. Compared with gains of almost 12 million medium skilled jobs, 4.6 high skilled, and 11 million very high skilled jobs. The fastest growing occupations are those that have long required at least some college attainment. Further, educational expectations are rising, so occupations that once held a low level of college attainment um, are now held by people with e a medium skill level, even if the job requirements haven't really changed. Um, George M Mason estimates future job growth in the Washington region is expected to be driven by three sectors, professional and business services, education and health services, and construction. While at least some of these jobs will require college education, some of them are also supposed to be entry level and lower wages than the current workforce. To achieve this growth, we'll also need to have and build the right type of housing, including more rental units. They estimate at least 44% of the region's rental stock will need to be available for less than $12.50 per month to accommodate new workers in the next 20 years. In addition, we need to think about how to move workers from low-skill occupations to higher-skilled ones where the job growth is at and connect them with the education and job training they need. We have some opportunities in the region to do this and change how we are doing workforce development. Congress passed the Workforce Opportunity Investment Act in 2014, um, and the district and the states will need to develop new implementation plans by early 2016. Uh, WIOA, as it's known, adds new emphasis to engaging with employers across the workforce system in order to better align job training with the skills employers need and to be able to match employers with qualified workers when the training is complete. The act adds more flexibility and allows for on-the-job training to be reimbursed at higher rates. It promotes the use of a career pathways approach, which allows for multiple entry and exit points so that individuals can start on the pathway, whether they've graduated from high school or not, and exit so they can enter the workforce when they need to, and then be able to return to education when they are able. This approach also requires coordination between services and between education and workforce sectors. For an example, after California's largest utility company, PG&E, recognized that baby boomer retirements were creating a shortage of new employees, it teamed up with a local community college to pilot a training program for entry-level jobs. The program has graduated more than 200 students, more than half of whom have been women or people of color, and a majority of these graduates have taken utilities jobs that pay between $19 and $29 per hour. Finally, uh, WIOA has added stronger performance management goals and transparency requirements, which present an opportunity for jurisdictions to better learn and share about what's really working. Just adding new jobs and bringing new employers to town doesn't necessarily mean that the low income will see the same benefits. But there doesn't have to be a trade-off between economic growth and equity. Research has examined this trade-off and found that it doesn't hold. Countries have taken different developmental trajectories and have not necessarily had to become more unequal in order to grow. South Korea has had a relatively equitable development over the last half century, while Brazil has grown very unequally until recently. Even in our own country, we experienced both economic growth and growing equality after World War II up until the 70s, but have seen reduced equality and economic growth since then. There is increasing evidence from academic literature, including studies based on the U.S., that inequality can hinder growth. Researchers have found that a higher share of income going to the middle income quintile within a state led to more growth. And Manuel Pastor from USC found that greater equality within a region was related to stronger regional growth. When pursuing and adding new jobs to the regional economy, jurisdictions need to think about how to practice economic inclusion. By that, I mean conditions that make it possible for all people to both share in rising pr prosperity and contribute to it. Inclusion is concerned both with consumption, what low-income people are getting, and production, what low-income people make and do. A more equitable regional economy would improve access to jobs throughout the region, including transportation routes to get to those jobs, and improve the education and skill level of its workers. Examples from across the country indicate that anchor institutions make good partners in these efforts. It's also important to promote diversity and entrepreneurship in, for equ equitable development. 
For example, there's an accelerator for technology startups for African American and Latino entrepreneurs called New Me, based in San Francisco. New Me aims to broaden access to the kind of experts, resources, and environments for collaborative problem solving that have been traditional in this field. I've just outlined a series of challenges and a few opportunities for the District of Columbia, Montgomery, and Prince George's counties. Even if it were possible for the city and county councils to authorize spending and find housing for those individuals and families who are currently homeless this afternoon, it wouldn't solve the underlying issues and we might all be back here next March having the same conversation. What's needed is coordinated action. It is an affordable housing problem, but it's also an education problem and a jobs and economic development problem. And in an environment where there are fewer federal dollars and more people to serve, coordination is necessary to do more with less. Improved coordination can help an individual family access benefits that are, they are eligible for. Coordination across homeless service providers can call attention to changing trends and share effective strategies. Coordination across agencies can help connect education and training opportunities to jobs and employers. It can help returning citizens move into transitional housing and give them a chance to get back on their feet. It can connect homeless service providers with the workforce and mental health services. It could also mean finding new ways to use existing revenue streams, such as using TANF block grant funds to pay for homeless prevention, or state Medicaid savings to pay for supportive housing. Finally, this region has a history of coordination across jurisdictions and learning from each other on the homeless issue, and have, with the Council of Government's assistance, conducted the regional point in time count since 20, 2001, and maintained a committee to share lessons on how to reduce chronic homelessness and better house the region's homeless population. I'm looking forward to following the work of this new collaboration and seeing what it can accomplish. Thank you. Thank you, Leah, and I guess your whole presentation leads us to the real um, importance of the coordination uh, of our jurisdiction. So now I wanna call up uh, the three, three people who ultimately, I believe, are responsible for the implementation of the policies. I know them or know of them, and they're all phenomenal leaders. So I believe this is, this is your podium. Um, Uma Awalia, who directs Health and Human Services here in Montgomery County, and an old friend. Gloria Brown, who directs the Department of Social Services in Prince George's County, and Laura Zeilinger, she's the director of the Department of Human Services in the District of Columbia. So, yeah. I'm gonna start with um, asking you to respond to Leah's presentation and how your jurisdiction fits with the ideas um, and aligns with those that she presented to us. So I think we should just go down the line okay. um, and start with Uma. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with so many familiar faces and old and new friends. Um, I have had such good uh, relationships, both with Prince George's and the District of Columbia, that. It's just um, trying to even coordinate this was like old home week for all of us, right? Because so, we knew everybody. Um, I, uh, Leah, your points were extremely, um, I think, um, on point for us. Um, here in Montgomery County, we've seen a 59% increase in cost of living over the last decade with only a 17% increase um, in family income. And poverty has grown from about 5.1% to 7% today. All of this sort of points to the housing burden that our families are experiencing. Um, the self-sufficiency survey uh, in Montgomery County says that uh, a family of three that is a single mom with um, a school-aid child and a preschool-aid child needs $76,000 to live in the county. This really creates a significant housing burden. Um, and so we have seen like everybody else, increases in doubling up, increases in family, uh, young families particularly being put out and showing up in the homeless system. Um, so there are many subpopulations like everyone else that we're working with, um, single adults, chronically homeless, um, young parents, often single parent households with young kids, 
with a GED or less education with very little earnings potential. So you have to sort of worry about how are we going to get these folks to independence and housing. In one of our experiences, um, we've seen as probably with Prince George's a very significant growth in suburban poverty in our communities. And as we sort of try to look at these issues, we looked at a few very innovative um, opportunities, and one of them was featured in the Brookings Institute called the Neighborhood Opportunity Network. And as we were doing this work with our partners, Catholic Charities, Family Services, um, Mary Center, one of the things we found was families really want to be self-sufficient. They do not want to be dependent on government for their services. So if you think about the safety net as a um, trampoline, people are coming, they're bouncing, and they're bouncing off. What does that safety net trampoline really look like so they don't stay here, they need to be launched? And in order to do that, workforce is probably one of the most important issues. Um, but to do workforce, you need childcare, you need transportation, you need good jobs, you need education. Uh, and you need subsidized housing. And so pulling all of that together, and the, your, your paper is sort of pretty much referred to all of those issues, I think that's what we're trying to coordinate. Um, and that's what I hope that this collaboration is going to yield, not just sharing of best practices and sharing of um, data, but an opportunity for us to do work together and maybe leverage funds together, which I think will be enormously helpful for all of us. Our numbers look vastly different. When you said 8,000 homeless people, our numbers seem minuscule comparatively. <laughs> but for us, that's a lot. And we, when we say that we have more individuals living in motels, because um, we will take care of families, that's $100 a night per family. And if you cannot have them exit in 30 days, in 60 days, in 90 days, that cost starts to build. And it is no way to raise a family. It is not humane for families to be raised in hotel rooms. And so we're deeply committed. I know my friends at the table are deeply committed, and we're just delighted to be here with them. And I just want to do a quick shout out for all the providers and our staff who are in the room without whose work every day we couldn't make it work. And my partners at DHCA, uh, Clarence Snuggs, the director is over here, and from the Housing Opportunities Commission. I know there are folks here from there as well. We could not do our work every day without your support. So thanks very much. Good morning. Uh, I've, I, I cut my teeth um, on, in homeless services about 20 years ago in the District of Columbia. So this has truly been a, a reunion for me. I've seen a lot of people that I used to work with. And um, I got to tell you, over 20 years, I've never seen anything like the energy that we have going today and, and the plans that we have for the future. This is so exciting. This is an exciting time to be here, and it's not by mistake that we're all here, that we have the leaders that we have that are guiding us. Um, and I'm just, you know, I'm overwhelmed by that. Uh, in Prince George's County, uh, we've been, you know, we, like the county executive said, implementing our 10-year plan for like the last four years. And combine that with our county executive's vision um, for improving neighborhoods, six, six key neighborhoods in the Transforming Neighborhoods Initiative. It has given us the opportunity to really delve down into the root causes of homelessness and why families are so vulnerable. And Leah spoke to several of those issues, the employment, the, the affordable housing, but the education piece is so critical as well. It's the educating and making sure that children are stable in their homes, but it's also upgrading the skills of those parents uh, and getting them ready for those jobs that are coming. And so we've been working very closely with our community college, our, our workforce investment entity. Um, you know, they're the traditional partners that we have, health, family services, aging. But the non-traditional partners, I think, are critical if we're going to move this conversation forward. Um, uh, talking about the types of jobs that are coming and, and finding opportunities to get our citizens trained to be ready for those jobs right there in Prince George's County. Looking at community benefit and how while we're doing all this, this development, how we engage our business partners to help us move everybody along. Um, not just the people who are in the right place at the right time. So, it, you know, it's very exciting. Um, we, as we looked, as we drilled down and looked at some key populations, we have been focusing a lot of energy and attention on our unaccompanied and homeless youth. 
And to be quite frank with you, for years, my colleagues in the district had been telling me that my kids were coming over there for services. And um, we had to take a, a hard look, an honest look at who we had in the county, who, how many homeless young people we had, and where they were going for services. Uh, we partnered with Johns Hopkins University and conducted a study um, back in 2011, I think was the first study. And we enumerated those kids, and we talked to them. Uh, we did focus groups. We talked to the providers. And we, from, that, from that conversation, we moved forward with really developing a continuum of services for our young people in Prince George's County, where we have created, uh, let's see, we partnered with Sasha Bruce, as the county executive mentioned, and Weinberg to create Promise Place. But we also partnered with St. Anne's and with Maryland Multicultural Youth Center to create transitional beds, um, 65 transitional beds, as well as um, uh, using the host home model, beds where we could help kids leave the area for safety's sake. And, and that's just, you know, keep looking at the demographics and the issues that our kids become involved in. We knew that we had to be creative in how we began to build the, build the system. So that, that was one of the things that um, we immediately, you know, soon, and, and our county executive coming in when he came in was just, it was a perfect storm because there, there was will and there was passion behind, you know, him that helped us to move our agenda forward. So, you know, we are, we're forever thankful for that. But uh, in addition to that, we broke down our populations and prioritized some, some subpopulations, domestic violence, um, survivors and victims, uh, the unaccompanied youth, veterans, uh, returning citizens, and chronically mentally ill. So, and we're working, we have subgroups on all of those populations uh, where we meet regularly um, to work, look at um, many continuums for those populations. So again, I'm excited and uh, I know that we're gonna do some great things and it's gonna be sustainable. Thank you. Uh, I w again want to share the optimism that's in the room today and just the momentous occasion of really having uh, the region come together with the kind of political leadership to really get the job done in ending homelessness. Um, it was, you know, I think for most of us, um, it was not, homelessness was not something that uh, as an elected official, you'd want to make your flagship issue, it felt like an intractable problem and not one that you wanted to stand up and commit to solving. And so it is really a new day in this region that we have uh, the kind of energy to really to do that work. And we know, you know, we know what the solutions are um, because we've really identified the problem and, and what is behind those problems. So we know, as we've said, that Homelessness is an economic issue. It's about jobs. It's about access to opportunity. And we are so lucky to be in a region of growth. Uh, we're a region where uh, people, as everybody knows, live might live in one jurisdiction and work in another. And it is really when we work together collectively that we can that we absolutely can solve these problems. We can help build on the education strengths, give people the building blocks, the access to the skills and the jobs. They're going to allow them to have that foundation as a family where they can um, raise their children in stability. And for the people who need a fresh start, when we work together, we can do better at providing them a fresh start because we know that when we invest in people, that they are very resilient and that they can, homelessness is something that they can over, overcome, which is why we can say that it is something that we can support uh, people in solving. Um, we, um, you know, Today is really about collaboration. I'm so excited that uh, our interagency council under um, Christy Greenwald's leadership released a draft strategic plan yesterday for public comment. And that really, I think, is another, uh, demonstrates that we understand that homelessness is not something that sits either uh, in, in one jur jurisdiction to solve or in one body of government or in one government agency. It is really about how you bring together the affordable housing solutions with the job training, the access to jobs, the access to behavioral health supports, and, um, and partners and providers and advocates in the private sector to really, to really create a person-centered response. Uh, at the Department of Human Services, uh, homelessness is something that we work on every day, but so is how we help people who, uh, 
through the TANF program, through access to uh, supplemental nutrition assistance, through the job trainings, and through our partnerships uh, in government to, to access what the solutions are. So we know that we have a big problem to solve, and until we solve it, people who every day um, come from uh, the district and in, in and out of other counties, um, or whether they stay put, they're suffering. And uh, we have the resources to, to support them uh, to, to have the stability that they need and to, to be part of our community in a healthy way uh, where they can access the opportunity that we bring. So again, I just am, want to recognize uh, the partnership and how excited I am to learn from uh, what we're doing uh, right and to, to uh, you think about how we use data together uh, to serve people better and uh, and really uh, w welcome the, the you know the day that we're going to stand up and say that we're we've achieved something I also want to note that we have goals in common that we, it is um, in every single jurisdiction who's sitting around the table today we've all committed that we're going to end homelessness among veterans this year and um, we have federal resources that have come into our communities and we have the same VA Medical Center partner um, in several housing authorities at the table with us in doing it. We are all uh, have goals to end chronic homelessness in the next couple of years, and we are all very, very focused on supporting our families. So we've broken it down into measurable goals, and, um, and I look forward to, to working with everyone to achieve those goals together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was going to ask about uh, the, some of the challenges and opportunities, but you all really addressed that, as did the leaders. So I'm going to move on, because part of this is we've done national, we've done local, and now we've, I want to talk to you a little about the regional piece of it, which is, as Gloria said, so, so unique right now. Um, so you talked about opportunities and um, short and long-term goals. How do you see explicitly the regional collaboration sort of advancing those? Some, get a little bit more specific. Either the opportunities, the challenges. Thank you. Gloria. I'll start it off. I think the first step is getting us all in the room on a consistent and regular basis to discuss um, the populations and to discuss strategies for working with those populations regionally. Um, we have not been in the same room. We have not had common conversations. We haven't looked at data and looked at trends and migration and, and all those other things that help us better understand the services that are going to benefit our populations. So I think, you know, step one is just getting us all in the room together and having honest and open conversations about who we're serving, who we're not serving, and how we can better serve them. Um, for us, I think coming together creates an opportunity to share best practices. We have enormous brain trust in the area of homelessness in the region, and so to be able to collaborate around that, to share data, to know is it in fact true that people are moving cross jurisdiction? Is it in fact true that they're asking for specific kind of resources in jurisdiction A or jurisdiction B? Is there a myth that someone's doing more and therefore let's go over there? And, and this, this community is more generous, so we're going to find our way over there. Is that, in fact, accurate? Or is that a small enough percentage that the focus really has to be on improving the continuum of services where people live? Um, I also think, um, given the, the economic development and jobs environment that we're all sharing, everybody's talking about growth. Everybody's talking about creating new jobs. And everyone talks about the healthcare sector, the service sector, the construction sector. How are we going to create those partnerships with education, with higher education, with our public school system? Um, I believe that there has to be a two-generation poverty strategy for us to truly, truly dig deep into the issues of family poverty and stop this cycle of homelessness from recurring. From po uh, and, and so. We're all saying the exact same thing. I think our language is the same. I think our definitions are the same. I think the strategies many of us are thinking about are the same. What a perfect moment for us to come together and deepen the work. So that's my hope for the work. Um, there, I, I agree fully uh, with my partners across the jurisdiction on what some of the opportunities are. And I think to just bring it even more to a specific level, 
we're all uh, doing some new things at the same time. So we are all um, looking at how do we implement WIOA in a way that we are more meaningfully connecting people to job opportunities and partnering in new ways with our workforce systems. And I think having the ability to share not just the thing, best practices that we know are working and that we're all doing, but also as we take on some of those new challenges. Rapid rehousing is a fairly new intervention in um, the, among homeless service providers, and I think we all are struggling with how do we get the balance of how much assistance we're providing and really how do we use that as a way of launching families, creating urgency and responsibility um, on, on their part and on our part in a way that is going to uh, support them in being very successful. And so there's, we, uh, there, we're, there are new there are new areas I, in stre and challenges that we take on every day in really solving this problem, and I think those are some concrete things that we can we can certainly look at together. Uh, and going after money. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank you all. Now, um, to turn to another side of your brains, so we've all come back, we're sitting here a year later, and um, I want to ask you, what are your shared hopes? You're sitting here, it's only a year, we get it. But if you, in your story, or as my friend said, in your movie, um, what are your shared hopes? I'll start this time so I don't have to think of something new as people are talking. <laughs> Um, well, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we, we have that same goal that we'll end homelessness among veterans this year, and I think that's just, I'd like us to be able to stand together even sooner than a year out um, and say, we, we set a goal, we had the resources, we made those resources work in a way that people who risk their lives so that we can have the kind of freedom we enjoy are all welcomed home in our region, and um, we can learn from that success and that proof positive but to really show homelessness is something that we, we will solve in our region. Well, it's only a year out. I know. So, um, <laughs> referencing what Chairman Le Leventhal said earlier, resources for each jurisdiction to know what's available in the other jurisdiction so that when our citizens come to Silver Spring for a meal you know where to send them in Prince George's County um, and and vice versa um, just you know and something like that sounds really simple but rest assured the, de the devil is in the details <laughs> Well, you're right. I have to think of something new to say, right? Because I agree with both of them. So one of, one of my big hopes is that our chief executives will be sitting right over there a year from now, able to claim victory on these small things that we just talked about, right? They're not small, they're big, but that their commitment and their faith in all of us will be fully realized. And so um, I, I think it'll be good. <laughs> Profound so, statement. We'll all be, be back here. <laughs> Is it? On St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> um, oh, I know there are green cards on your seat, but this has been such a deep and rich conversation. Um, what I'd like to do is just ask one or two people um, if you have a question, and that relates directly to the comments of our panelists or to um, Leah's presentation. Just a couple. Who would like to break the ice? Come on. We Sue Marshall, we're right. good friends. You're in the district. Do you have anything that you'd like to comment on? And then I'm going to do um, Council Member Leventhal. Well, Marty, thank you for the opportunity. And I'd like to share the enthusiasm as someone who has been working on this for decades. And I'm really excited to be here with many of the partners. My question is, You all, did you hear the question? Yes. yes. <laughs> Who'd like to start on that one? Oh, you said repeat the question, right? The question is, how do you think we can collaborate on the regional housing market? Did I get that right? Yes. To make better use of the available resources. Well, it will be one of those issues that we actually have to collaborate on to give you an answer, to be honest with you. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think part of the reason we're coming together is to identify data exchange issues, 
um, workforce issues on a regional basis, leverage accessible housing on a regional basis. Affordable isn't often enough for our populations. We really have to look at permanent supportive, which really requires deep subsidies. So then the question about these are my resources, how do I share them, become quite critical in figuring out what the protocols are and how we're going to share and have this conversation. So I think it would be, I don't feel like I can answer your question with any great degree of competence today. I can tell you the willingness is there for us to have the conversation. I think when we create this high level staff team that's going to sit down, these will be the kind of difficult issues that we'll have to sort through. Um, I don't think any of your communities now have housing that is less expensive. Um, and so it really puts pressure. And we can't keep sending people further and further out into the suburbs or into rural communities where transit is an issue, jobs aren't there. So we know that we have a commitment to figuring out what does mixed use housing look like? How do we leverage? What are those opportunities? I think we have to come together. So the specifics have to wait for the conversations to happen. Sorry. Anybody else? Thanks, Uma. Thank you, Sue. Um, Council Member Leventhal. Well, a, a couple of thoughts. First of all, um, I wonder whether Prince George's County and the district have similar rules to what I mentioned earlier, where um, we will pretty much feed anyone we want to do intake for pretty much anyone, um, but we are providing housing other than emergency, you know, tonight crisis type stabilization for folks who became homeless in Montgomery County. Is that the same policy for Prince George's? Is it the same in the district? Yes, pretty much. Um, obviously, if there are extenuating circumstances or if we're working with a domestic violence survivor, we try to um, be creative and accommodate. But for the most part, yes. So I think we take a little bit more of a nuanced approach in the district. Um, we, when people apply, uh, of course, anybody, we do same, we will meet the emergency needs of people uh, who present for food, who are, per, per, when uh, families apply, we have, we're the only jurisdiction that is, has right to shelter. And uh, when we do intake for shelter, we do ask people where they're coming from and we do, um, we do by law in our community prioritize uh, people who were living in the district or district residents for the services that we provide. But we also know that people are transient and that when people intend to stay in a particular place, they have the constitutional right to do so. And so we really do try to walk a more nuanced balance. And if um, somebody has chosen to make the District of Columbia their home, we want to um, work with them in a way where we're not taking them far away from um, where they will have supports and where their home community is, but when, um, but we also won't suggest that they have to sleep on our streets, and we won't find a solution for them because where they came from is not a place that um, that they intend to return to. So I think we we you know we really look at it on a case by case basis. We really try to work with people in ways um, where they find solutions. Just like people who are have housing and have resources, folks move when they are, experience homelessness. And I think one of the commitments that we have in in term in one of the opportunities. Of of this regional collaboration is how do we create a situation where people at least within the region don't have to travel to try to get their needs met but they can there we're all committed to meeting needs in ways where we're investing in the solutions and the policies that we know work so that um, that we that, that we're not creating more burden on people uh, to, to have to uh, you know move for that purpose and I have one more comment on that having worked in the district for several years um, as a service provider, I know that, um, uh, Laura kind of hinted to this, people come to the District of Columbia sometimes to be homeless. And we ha um, have worked with people whose destination was the District of Columbia and, and trying to help them navigate the services that they needed and getting them stabilized. It, and it proves to be you know, a little bit more challenging, but I know that that's a, a, an additional challenge that the District of Columbia often has. I don't think people you know, look, find Prince George's County on the map and say, hey, I want to go there, but I know that it happens in the District of Columbia. Thank you all. Um, 
I, I want to thank you all. You have the right people at the right time in these jobs. Well done. Um, so uh, we're gonna we're right on time. We're gonna move to the the next part, the very uh, the landmark part, to use Uma's terms. But I want to thank you all. All right, so what, what the, our principals have in front of them is what we're calling a charter to end homelessness. And um, once they sign an um, eight and a half by 11 copy, we'll make copies for you to have. But the charter says, whereas every resident deserves a place to call home and whereas we firmly believe homelessness can and must be eliminated in our communities and whereas we can effectively end homelessness by regional collaboration with an emphasis on addressing its most fundamental causes and whereas, oh, thank you. <laughs> because of our mutually shared passion for eliminating homelessness, the time is right to align our systems, jointly harness new resources and build on local innovation and whereas we are committed to ending homelessness across all populations, now therefore be it resolved we hereby establish a regional coordinating council on homelessness with executive level membership from each of our three jurisdictions and charge this body with the development and implementation of an actionable plan to work towards permanently ending homelessness in, Washington, in the Washington metropolitan region. Signed this 17th day of March in the year 2015. What an historic day, yes. So we're gonna end um, the, uh, today's work with a call to action um, by each of our leaders. And I don't, I guess, would you like to start? The county executive would like it? Thank you. First of all, let me again thank all of you for making this happen today. I know it took a great deal of collaboration and hard work to bring all of us here today and to reflect on this very important matter. Some years ago, I was speaking before our agriculture community in the agriculture community in Montgomery County. And I said to them that to preserve the agriculture community in Montgomery County, that the agriculture community in Montgomery County in and of itself could not do that that it required all the other people throughout Montgomery County to save the agricultural community. And people were somewhat shocked by that statement. But the reality of that statement is what we face here today, that when we talk about ending homelessness, it cannot be ended by the people who are homeless, and nor can it be ended solely by the people who advocate the programs itself for the homeless. It takes all of us, the broader community. And this is why today is so important, because it starts the dialogue. It increases the visibility. It raises this issue to the top of the list, to have executives to come to talk about an issue that is not always the most popular one, not the most politically convenient one to talk about, to raise the consciousness of everyone else. Because at the bottom line, that everyone else must help provide the resources that we need, 
It must help to allow us to locate in communities that oftentimes there are some contradictions and opposition. So part of what we are doing today in signing this contract and being here today is to do just that, not to necessarily advocate in front of those who are advocates for homeless or the people who are in fact homeless, but for the rest of the broader communities in the District of Columbia, Montgomery County, and Prince George's County. Let us be clear, this is not just a photo op. This charter is the beginning of a determined effort among the three of us to end homelessness. We agree on the basic points. Every resident of every jurisdiction deserves a home. And we agree that we can, in fact, eliminate homelessness. We can use the tools at our disposal, affordable housing, workforce development, economic development, and other services, all of which contribute to our fight against homelessness. So what are we going to do here today is to sign, and we've signed this, and we put our names on this dotted line, and words, but we need to have action. I pledge personally, and I'm sure that my county council president and others agree with me, that Montgomery County is to be a part of the Regional Coordinating Council on Homelessness. This council will come up with an action plan to attack the problem of homelessness on a regional level with resources, suggestions, ideas, and programs from all of the entire area to be dedicated and directed toward our one goal in this homelessness in our region. I'm proud to be a part of this effort today, and I'm pleased that my colleagues and I are joining together on this landmark agreement. I want to thank again the staff and all of those who've been here today to help make this important day possible. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Leggett, for, for hosting us here today. And I, too, want to join in congratulating um, and thanking the panelists who were up here. And I think they demonstrated their energy and ideas um, and resolve um, to working with each of us to make sure that homelessness is rare, brief, and non-recurring. I also want to acknowledge uh, the members of my team um, who joined us here. Adrian Totman from our Housing Authority, Deborah Carroll, who leads our Department of Employment Services, um, Christy Greenwald was introduced earlier, who leads our Interagency Council on Homelessness, uh, Polly Donaldson, who's here, who is um, over our Housing and Community Development um, Department, and Brenda Donald, who's our Deputy, Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services. Um, and, and I want to thank her for her leadership. As I understand, she's touched just about everybody who has been <laughs> in, in one way or, or the other. And Beverly Perry, who is my senior advisor, who works with me um, on regional issues um, across all regional issues, and I want to thank her for that. Um, and I too want to use this time to talk about what what else, what other help we need. Uh, the government can do a lot, but not everything. Um, and we're going to need our very smart people out here in the private sector who figure out how to make very complicated deals work every single day um, to put their minds around um, what they can do to better help us. Um, so to the banking community, how can you leverage the hundreds of millions of dollars that you pour into this region every single year um, to develop high-end apartments, to develop great hotels, to develop all the things that are making the quality of life in this region fantastic. How can you leverage those investments um, to help us build, preserve, um, build and preserve affordable housing and create good paying jobs? To our development community, um, who we're thankful for their partnership in helping us bring the District of Columbia back. How can you look at our rules or regulations? And where they don't work, you know, we'll fix them. Um, and where you can and focus on building more affordable units or more deeply affordable units, um, we're willing to partner with you uh, to, to make it work. Uh, to, all, to my council and to all of the legislatures who ultimately have to make sure uh, that we are, have the resources that we need, uh, help us put a down payment uh, on this commitment um, and make sure that we're investing in tested, um, but in sound, 
interventions, um, but that we can have the commitment. So if I say that we, we can meet this by the end of this year, or if I say that we can end family homelessness and um, close uh, shelters that aren't working, uh, we need you to back us up. Uh, and to our neighbors, uh, I'm so pleased to be here with you today, County Executive, um, and to see the plans for a very humane and small facility. Um, but I'm also grateful to the people of Silver Spring who are welcoming uh, to a small and humane public facility. And we're gonna need about eight of those. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna need about eight of those. And they're gonna be in somebody's neighborhood. Uh, so this call to action is to communities who've said we want to end um, the scourge of family homelessness. We want to close down dilapidated um, shelters. So my call to action is to my fellow Washingtonians and fellow Americans uh, to also stand up uh, and speak up and be welcoming and supportive of interventions that work. Thank you, everybody. You know, there is an advantage of going last, because you can just say, me too. <laughs> but I won't. <laughs> um, no, no, I want to uh, thank my partners here, certainly County Executive Leggett and Mayor Bowser, uh, for being together on this important issue. Um, you know, I, I think Mayor Bowser hit it right on the head. Uh, these, you know, homeless, um, places are going to be in someone's neighborhood. And guess what? They're going to house your neighbors. They're going to house families. They're going to house children that go to school with your children. And you know why? Because they're all part of our community. Whether they live in the District of Columbia, Montgomery County, or Prince George's County, they're ours. We all belong to each other. We can't rise without taking everybody with us. Because if you calculate the cost, if you calculate the cost, you'll see why this is so important. Uh, in Prince George's County, um, and this was briefly mentioned that um, we have this, our single initiative, and the thing that I'm most proud of in this administration is our Transforming Neighborhood Initiative, which looked at six areas throughout Prince George's County where we had our most challenging issues facing us, whether it was lack of job opportunities, whether it was crime, whether it was transportation, you name it, education, dropout. Um, and it just so happened, if you look at those areas in Prince George's County, those six areas, they abut the District of Columbia. They abut Montgomery County. So when we talk about homelessness and veteran homelessness and children, it's them coming back and forth into our school systems, into our health systems. Without sharing data, without working together, we can't solve that problem. Um, I think it was Uma who said that, you know, we can't keep pushing them way out where there's no transportation. You know what that does? That exacerbates the problem. It means we're just kicking the can down the road. What today is about is no more kicking it down the road. What today is about is everybody taking responsibility. What today is about is destroying the myth that is one jurisdiction that's doing it. You know, they're all coming from somewhere else. That's what you hear when you want to spend some money. They, it ain't mine, they came from somebody else, somewhere else. Is that, I used to say a good friend of mine, no, they ours. <laughs> they belong to us. They are children. And it ain't a bad thing. Think about it. This is probably the most important thing we could do today as leaders. Not answer your questions, but sit here. Because somewhere, as I was sitting here watching the mayor, and I know she's the newest among us, that somebody in the District of Columbia is saying, where the hell is the mayor? Because <laughs> I know that's what they say to me. <laughs> she in Silver Spring, you know, at this homeless summer. 
homeless summit? What the heck is she doing at a homeless summit? Don't she know we got real problems? Yes, she does. That's why she's there. It's the signal you send how serious you are, how you spend your time. Money and time, things you can't get back. How you spend your time. That's why we're here, and that's why you're here. Thank you. Indeed, it is my honor to have been a part of this and to, I, to adjourn this historic event. And uh, thank you so much. We look forward to next year. <laughs>